I want to start today by, by bringing you greetings from Secretary Clinton, who I know really would have wanted to be here. Um, she's actually taking two weeks of vacation, which she hasn't done since she started. Um, I happen to know that she's continuing to make phone calls and putting out statements about Libya and stuff like that. The, the woman does not recreate very well, but, uh, but I, I, I'm, I'm glad that she's at least away from the department and um, taking a much deserved uh, break from the, the day to day. Um, I know that she really would have liked to have been here today because I, she is deeply committed to breaking new ground in the quest for LGBT equality in her current job. And I know that she sees, as I do, uh, the role that you play as journalists is critically important to that effort. One of the nice things about her not being here today is that I get to brag to my boss a bit, so I want to tell you a little bit about what she's done so far. I was sworn in in November of 2009, and from the moment I started, Hillary Clinton and her chief of staff, Cheryl Mills, and the team they lead at the State Department have been 110% behind a major push to integrate the human rights of LGBT people into American foreign policy. For Secretary Clinton, this is part of the continuation, in part, the continuation of a trajectory that included her being the first First Lady to march in a Pride Parade in 1999, her work on behalf of LGBT citizens of New York as Senator, her honest and open discussions on the campaign trail in 2008, and now her role as America's chief diplomat. It's also the continuation of a lifelong commitment to advance a more inclusive idea of who counts, from her early work as an activist for marginalized children, to that truly epic moment when she rejected enduring efforts to put women's rights to the side, saying plainly, women's rights are human rights, and human rights are women's rights. For a casual listener, that line can sound like just a little bit of wordplay. But it's not. It's a crucial philosophical assertion. To say that women's rights are human rights, and human rights are women's rights, is to put forth two important truths. First, that women's rights aren't special, or optional, or separate. There are human rights that attach to women because women are people. And second is the fact that women count. That when we talk about human rights, every woman is part of that universe of humanity to which human rights apply. Human rights belong to women, too. So it wasn't just an opportune echo, it was a significant advance when last year, remarking that she didn't understand why it had to be said, but if it had to be said, she would surely say it, she said, gay rights are human rights, and human rights are gay rights. The human rights of LGBT people aren't special or separate or optional. They follow from the same set of universal commitments. And LGBT people count as people. LGBT status is irrelevant to one's claim to human dignity, and it is irrelevant to one's deserving of respect. Secretary Clinton's leadership has been crystal clear, and in the first two and a half years of the Obama administration, senior officials from the State Department have been encouraged to engage diplomatically with heads of state and cabinet ministers from dozens of countries around the world on behalf of the human rights of LGBT people. We have reached out to encourage protection of those under threat and investigation of hate crimes. We've won support and for endorsements of the human rights of LGBT people in international forums, including two months ago at the Human Rights Council, the first ever UN resolution supporting LGBT human rights. I was there on the, council, uh, on the floor of the council that day, and uh, it's hard to explain. I, I didn't predict it, uh, and I couldn't have, how momentous that occasion was. As the vote was cast, and it was a close vote, it was 23 to 19, uh, as the vote was cast, there was, uh, I've been in the Human Rights Council a number of times in this job, there was a buzz in the room like never before, and the people on both sides, uh, there had been delegations that had given vigorous speeches on either side, and the people on both sides, as the votes came in, recognized that the tide was changing, and unstoppably so, and it was a really dramatic moment. We've matched our di diplomacy with ramped up efforts to support advocates and activists on the ground, often in the most difficult places, to organize and advocate for LGBT equality in their communities. Our ambassadors have publicly supported and participated in pride celebrations, We've stood up a new fund that gets emergency assistance to those who are targeted for their advocacy, and we're developing programs that will help network LGBT groups on the ground and build their capacity to document abuses, uh, to advocate for strategic litigation and organization building. Our embassies around the world are reinvigorating their efforts to reach out to local actors. We're developing a toolkit to help embassy staff maximize the effectiveness of their engagement, and we're continuing to beef up our reporting on abuses in the country reports on human rights practices, which my bureau publishes every year about every country in the world. I'm a lucky guy. A generation ago, I couldn't have been an openly gay man in my job. 
Today, not only do I get to serve in a State Department that is transformed, I get to serve under a secretary and a president who are committed to progressive change, to amplifying the move toward equality here at home and around the world, and to insisting that LGBT people count. Before I came into government, I was a professor. I'm trained as a pol uh, political theorist and a philosopher, so I have to be mindful in this job of tendencies to stray into the abstract and theoretical. Most of us grew up in history classes that, quite falsely, I think, taught us that the engine of modern history is a series of contests between giant abstractions, contests be of, of religion, contests between capitalism and communism, contests between colonialism and self-determination, and so on. Surely these contests are not meaningless fabrications. They're important lenses that help us understand and make sense of collections of events. But the engine of history is in ideas. It's people. And in my work as a diplomat, as I travel the world and meet with foreign leaders, human rights activists, journalists, religious leaders, and others wherever I go, I see that without a doubt, progress, by which I mean real change on the ground for real people, depends not on the beauty of your, or elegance of your ideas. Progress depends on the stories you tell about people about their real lives, their joys, their pains, the injustices they suffer. The way that we come to know dignity, that dignity is something supremely valuable, is that we come to know stories of people who have had theirs vulnerably and violently trampled. And we know stories of those who have courage courageously, against all odds, stood up to defend themselves or the dignity of others. The stories make our ideas real. The narrative pre precedes the analytic. I'm the first to defend and be enthralled by the elegant aesthetic of the concept of rights that attach to each of us equally in virtue of our shared humanity. However, human rights don't start with an abstraction, no matter how elegant. Human rights start with the stories we tell. I want to say a bit more about the role of journalists in this respect, and about the intersection between journalism and free media, media and human rights. Most often, the conversation about human rights, when we talk about journalists, we talk about journalists as rights holders, uh, as persons entitled to freedom of expression and freedom from retribution. And often we talk about the ways in which journalists in many, many countries around the world continue to be abused, harassed, and even killed for doing their jobs. And of course, it's in this light that one of the indicators we use to tell whether a society respects human rights, including freedom of expression, is that it has a free press and that journalists can practice their craft. Our commitment to the freedom of expression is grounded in the fact that it is a fundamental freedom, recognized in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and it's part of that fundamentally human basket of entitlements, the rights that make a life rec recognizably, distinctively human. In that sense, we believe in it not because it's productive or instrumentally good, but simply because it's what human dignity demands. Free expression is a right, independent of whether whatever other benefits we may see free expression producing. Nonetheless, if asked, most of us could readily suggest ways that societies that protect freedom of expression benefit from doing so. Some might say that such societies are less likely to have problems with public corruption or exploitation by the most powerful. Others might point out that a free press is critical to the political competition that produces democracy's dividends. Anyone who has lived in a censored press environment would be able to tell you that a free press is undoubtedly more interesting. Editors of today's tabloids probably could have forgiven Pravda for being untrue. It was the fact that it was dull that would have been the real deficiency. But one of the benefits that's less likely to be mentioned is the fact that in societies in which the stories of individual people are freely shared in the public sphere, there is a perennially refreshed set of reference points for understanding and knowing the human experience. Those stories, in highlighting the joints and pains, particularly of so-called ordinary people, remind us of their humanity, and remind us that human lives really are quite extraordinary. They remind us that underneath our shared experience resides a common humanity, the common humanity that grounds a shared set of individual rights and common duties to each other. Conversely, in, st in societies where the freedom of expression and the free press are cur curtailed, <coughs> the stories of people are suppressed. And much more often than not, it's not just freedom of expression that is curtailed. Governments that fail to respect the freedom of expression fail to respect the rights of citizens more generally. In order to hold authorities accountable for protecting and respecting rights, we need to know more than that the laws of the land include human rights and that leaders pay lip service to the, those commitments in the rhetoric of political speeches. We need to know the stories of real people and whether they conform to the commitments and obligations of states. This is why the stories that you tell as journalists are so important. 
The stories you tell give a human face to the wrongs perpetrated by governments against the vulnerable. They expose failures to protect. They make plain for readers, listeners, and viewers the costs of a failure to respect human rights. The stories you tell embarrass leaders, outrage citizens, and make undeniable the gaps between rhetoric and reality. But equally importantly, and often simultaneously in the same story, by providing an account of particular episodes in particular lives, you paradoxically remind us that of the universality of the human experience. When we are moved to tears by the story of a mother in Somalia watching her fourth child die of starvation, it's not because she's different, it's because she's the same. And that sameness is fundamental to both the philosophical truth underlying human rights and to motivating human beings to do more to protect and defend them in the here and now. The stories you tell highlight the wrongs and their costs. They also highlight the humanity of specific people and in so doing give us cause to believe in the humanity and human rights of all people. In, in the context of human rights of LGBT people, I think it's particularly important that we not lose sight of the role of journalists in affirming the common humanity of all people. Not by making political arguments for equality, but by telling stories about individual lives that provide the evidence for that claim. Let me give a familiar example. A few years back, when the New York Times announced that they would start carrying wedding announcements for gay couples, a lot of people saw that as an important step for the political statement it made. The New York Times was endorsing a notion, an abstract one, that gay partnerships were substantively similar to straight ones. But I would argue that the more powerful effect, particularly in changing the minds of the people who hadn't already bought into the abstract argument, was in the stories that followed on the pages. Both because the stories about gay couples meeting, falling in love, taking a break, sorting through a misunderstanding or a logistical challenge, and then ending up together, were pretty much the same as the familiar stories of straight couples and the evolution of their relationships, and more simply because the protagonists in those stories were gay people who were just, well, people, plain and simple. I'm going to go out on a limb here, and I'm probably going to be the first student of human rights or public official to connect the wedding section to human rights, but the simple truth is, in whatever part of journalism you find yourself, from TV news to local radio to photo spreads to the wedding section, the stories you tell are part of the foundation for human rights, because they are the most prevalent and popular public account of what it is to be human. Human rights start, start with the stories we tell about what it means to be human. Before concluding, I, I want to say a quick word not about the stories you tell, but about the stories you bring to your craft. After all, the organization under whose auspices we meet today is as much about shared identity as it is about shared endeavor. And there are a lot of folks who might be understandably skeptical of that. I've never joined a gay friend in, in DC who works for a major newspaper told me, I'm not a gay journalist, I'm a journalist. Most of us have had similar thoughts. I have whenever I've participated in LGBT groups organized around my profession. And given that in so many cases, the goal is to get people to not pay attention to something that should be irrelevant to rights or job advancement or acceptance, it can seem odd or even counterproductive to call attention to that supposedly irrelevant fact. But of course, on the other hand, my friend is wrong. He is a gay journalist. And like any journalist, where he's come from, including not only being gay, but having been raised on the farm, having gone to a particular college, having read certain books, the places he's traveled, etc., all shape the stories he tells because they shape that he tells because they shape how he sees the world. For my own part, I hope that having spent an adolescence, often characterized by feeling different or fearing exclusion, has enhanced my compassion and my empathy for others in my role as a teacher, manager, and diplomat. And in your work, of course, the lives you've led inevitably are the prism through which the lives you examine and write about are refracted. The stories you bring are part of the foundation you work from in the stories you tell. So thank you for inviting me here today. Thank you for the work you do to capture, capture the human story through an ongoing and ever-expanding collection of accounts of individual lives, their joys and their sorrows, their failures and their triumphs. It's through the stories of others that we come to see their humanity, that we arrive at our intuitive understanding of what human dignity is, why it applies to each of us, and what it demands from each of us. Thank you for the stories you tell.